your thoughts on that? Bobby Kennedy and his brother, Senator John Kennedy, who served on the committee, charged that the Teamsters were... Uh, you have opposition from anybody that you dispose of them by having them stuffed in a trunk? Is that what you do, Mr. Gene Connell? The plan has to be called an ice believe my answer might turn into Can you tell us anything about any of your operations? And I have $300 million. Well, I wish I had a million dollars. That's it. Many more things we remember have been said about me. Welcome to Chapter 9. Well, we finally got to this part of the series about the two 1933 kidnappings in Chicago. The previous chapters helped set the stage for this chapter, establishing connections between the mob and the entertainment industry. I've mentioned in previous chapters that these events happened over 80 years ago, and reports may vary depending on the source. Let me tell you the story of the con man John Jake the Barber Factor, a family friend of my grandparents and sometimes client of my step-grandfather, Al Epstein, an attorney. I fell into a black hole doing the research on the details of Jake Factor's life. The FBI has a case file on John Jake the Barber Factor titled John Factor. It's 126 pages long and has many redactions. I've asked the FBI for this report in an unredacted version under the Freedom of Information Act back on January 21st in 2015. It's almost been a year and I've yet to receive that document. Something else that got my attention early on. Of all the movie and TV depictions about the 1920s and 1930s and the mob, there is no mention of Jake Factor. As you will learn, he was quite the character. There are many mentions of Jake Factor in books like Super Mob and The Outfit, by Gus Russo, Capone's Mob Murdered Roger Tuohy by John Tuohy, no relation, different spelling, and When Hollywood Had a King by Connie Bruck about Lou Wasserman and MCA. This was my main reason for making this series, to tell the story that's part of history left untold by TV or the movies. It would make a great screenplay. John Jacob Factor was a rabbi's son born Lakau Faktowitz, the youngest of 10 children. Jake, as he preferred to be called, was born in England, but was taken to Lotz, Poland before his first birthday, 
where he lived until he was 11 years old. He ranks as one of the most successful swindlers of all time. In his heyday, which spanned the era of the Roaring Twenties through the 1960s, Factor engineered frauds on both sides of the Atlantic, consorted with the Chicago mob, and charmed President John F. Kennedy and his Rat Pack pals during the golden age of JFK's self-styled Camelot regime. Jake's older half-brother, Max Factor, would go on to create an international cosmetic empire. Jake got his nickname because he worked at his brother's barbershop. Then later cut hair at Chicago's Morrison Hotel to help support his parents. In 1923, Jake Factor got in a partnership with the great New York criminal genius, Arnold Rothstein, the same mobster who rigged the 1919 World Series and became a kingpin for the Jewish mob in New York City, as well as partnering with Chicago's Al Capone. Rothstein put up $50,000 that Factor needed to set up a stock scam in England that fleeced thousands of investors, including the royal family, out of $1.1 million. In 1924, Jake and his wife Rella Cohen Factor, sister of gangster William Red Cohen, a convicted murderer in 1922, Jake and Rella skipped town. Early in 1925, Rothstein bankrolled Jake in another swindle. At the heart of the swindle was the Tyler Wilson & Company stock brokerage firm that Factor had invented. Then, without warning, Jake the Barber closed Tyler Wilson & Company and fled England with an estimated 1,619,000 pounds, or about $8 million. An incredible sum of money in the Depression. Kidnapping number one. Two days before Jake Factor was due to appear before the Supreme Court, on April 16, 1933, Jake the Barber's 20-year-old son, Jerome, was kidnapped in Chicago. Jerry Factor and my dad Charles were friends from Northwestern. I don't think this is the kidnapping my dad referred to when I was a kid. That was kidnapping too, and that was on July 1st, but more about that later on. A ransom note arrived asking for $50,000 from Jerome's kidnappers, who worked for Roger Tuohy, a competing gang to Al Capone's outfit. They were Buck Hendrickson, a former Cook County Highway Patrolman, and now a down-on-his-luck gambler and heavy drinker, Jim Wagner, the bookkeeper for Tui, and George Wilkie, Tui's business manager. I get the sense these were small-time operators looking for some easy money, and they did not tell their boss, Roger Tui. Jerome's dad, Jake, was highly visible in Chicago. Newspapers put his net worth at $20 million. Murray Humphreys, the labor plunderer for Al Capone's outfit, and also Jake Barber's close friend, led the negotiations with the kidnappers from a suite adjoining Factor's room. Chicago police raided a suite in the Congress Hotel, which the press dubbed the Hoodlum Detective Agency, and arrested the heirs to the Capone syndicate. Murray Humphreys, Machine Gun Jack McGurn, Sam Golf Bag Hunt, Tony Accardo, Frankie Rio, Phil D'Andrea, Rocco De Grazia, and half a dozen other mob hanger-ons. All of whom told the police the same thing. They were there because they'd been brought in by Murray Humphreys to secure Jerome Factor's safe return. The cops locked them up on vagrancy charges, but within an hour, Jake Factor posted their bail, and all were released. While police were in the apartment, they found a ransom note from Jerome's kidnappers. When questioned, Jake Factor claimed 
that he had written the note to confuse the kidnappers. After eight days in captivity, Jerome Factor was released on the Chicago street unharmed. Many people in Chicago simply assume that Jerome, the good son, had agreed to a kidnapping rigged by his father and Murray Humphreys to delay the U.S. Supreme Court hearing. With Jerome Factor returned home safely, Jake's appointment to appear before the United States Supreme Court was put back on the docket. Jake Factor got the idea from Jerome's kidnapping that if he faked his own kidnapping, he could run the clock out on extradition to England. Jake pitched his idea to Murray Humphreys, who told the acting boss Frank Nitti and outfit counsel Paul Rica about it. Nitti and Rica both liked it. Rica got the idea to frame Roger Toohey for Jake's kidnapping. Nitti did not want any of the syndicate's own people involved. Humphreys learned from Sam Hare, the owner of the Dells Nightclub Casino, that Jerome's kidnappers were Henriksen and Wilkie. With this tip, Humphrey, or one of his men, approached Henriksen and brought him to Chicago at gunpoint. Murray threatened Henriksen that he would tell Henriksen's boss, Roger Toohey, that he was involved with Jerome's kidnapping. Henriksen knew that Toohey would seek revenge. Murray Humphreys eventually offered Henriksen another choice. Jake Factor wanted to kidnap himself and the outfit wanted Roger Toohey to take the fall for the kidnapping. Humphreys, by enlisting Walter Buck Henriksen, who would not only get to live, but he could also make some easy money. Factor paid $70,000 to fake his kidnapping. Henriksen used some of that money to hire at least nine men to work the scam. They would fake the kidnapping and take Jake Factor to a safe house for a couple of weeks and then release him to the streets of Chicago. Jake would blame Roger Toohey for the kidnapping. Buck Henriksen got one of Toohey's bodyguards, Eddie Schwabauer, to go along with the scam and keep Jake Factor at his mother's house, where he was living with his children after his wife left him. The second kidnapping took place on July 1st, 1933. There were three cars with seven people. Some reports say there were two cars, and other reports have the passengers in different vehicles, but that's moot at this point. They were out for an evening of nightclubbing at the Dells in Morton Grove, Illinois. My guess is that they were out celebrating my dad's 19th birthday on July 3rd on Saturday instead of on Monday. These newspaper stories validate something I noticed in previous chapters. Mob members tended to give wrong names when being questioned by law enforcement or the press. These stories have the wrong names of my family. Let me break that one down for you by going through this newspaper story from 1933. Son and lawyer little concerned. Shortly after midnight this morning, in token of his unconcern, young Factor and his father's friend, attorney Al Epstein, who witnessed the abduction, left the Morrison with the yawning announcement that they were going home because there is no use sticking around here any longer. Later phone calls to the Epstein apartment in the Belden Stratford Hotel, 2300 Lincoln Park West, and the apartment of Jerome's mother, now Mrs. Leonard Marcus, 1216 Lunt Avenue, showed that the pair had followed their announced purpose and gone home. Story of the Kidnapping The suave, curly-haired speculator, once a Halstead Street barber, had gone to the Dell Saturday night to drink champagne and play the wheel. In his party were his second wife, the former Rella Cohen, the son Jerome, a lawyer friend, Al Epstein, of the Belden Stratford Hotel, and his wife. Two other friends, Mr. and Mrs. Charles L. Redlick, their son, Charles Redlick Jr., a classmate of Young Factors, and two other Northwestern students. 
Mr. and Mrs. Charles L. Redlick. It's not accurate. My parents had married until 1936, and my mother was not with them that night. And they spelled our last name Redlick with an H, as it was originally spelled, but later changed to Redlick, ending in a K. A classmate of Young Factors, and two other Northwestern students. I can't verify two other students. To my knowledge, it's not accurate. It was shortly after 1 a.m. when the Factor Party quit the Dells, bidding good night to the manager, Sam Hare. They drove east towards Evanston in three cars, Jerome's chums in the first machine, Factor and Epstein in the second, a brown Duesenberg. My research found that the car owned by Jake, but it was green, not brown. Driven by Jerome and Redlick and the women in the third. Police halt boys. At Dempster Road and Keeler Avenue, the boys encountered two Nile Center policemen, Emil Heinz and Gust Hiltz, and were stopped for speeding. They were engaged in a roadside parley with officers when Mrs. Factor drove up hysterical, as were the other women, and screamed to the policemen that Factor and Attorney Epstein had been kidnapped. Without pausing to hear the details, the policemen mounted their motorcycles and sped back to the kidnapping scene as described by Mrs. Factor. The spot at Dempster and Harms Road was deserted. Meanwhile, Attorney Epstein, who had been held involuntarily with Factor and was shoved out of the Factor car as the abductors fled, found the wife and told the story in detail. Our car with Jimmy at the wheel was stopped by two machines, he said. A bunch of men swarmed around us with shotguns and machine guns. I couldn't tell which. The women, whose car was not far behind, had the sense to stop at a distance. The boys had gone on ahead. One man pointed to Jack, Jake, and said, that's Factor. They blindfolded Jack, Jake, and me with handkerchiefs and put us in their car. They told Jerome to drive on in his father's car. On the drive, which lasted about two miles, Jack, Jake, whispered to me that it was a kidnapping. For God's sake, do what they tell you or they'll bump you off, he said to me. At Harms Road, they slowed down and shoved me out, warning me just before they opened the door to keep the blindfold on for five minutes or I'd be killed. I obeyed, but heard the second car of the kidnappers whiz past. Wife telephones police. Epstein related his version of the kidnapping at the Belden Stratford, 2300 Lincoln Park West, where he and the Redlicks both reside. Before his arrival there, Mrs. Factor had telephoned Lieutenant Leo Carr of the Chicago Police, one of the strange agglomeration of friends Factor had acquired, and begged him to do something. Lieutenant Leo Carr, who aided the promoter in negotiations for his son, at once took charge. At the Morrison Suite, it appeared, young Factor was resorting to the same tactics on the captive's behalf that his father had pursued for his release. When his son was seized, Factor had ignored police instructions, preferring to trust his own wits and seek aid from his friends of the nightclubs and from Murray Humphreys, boss racketeer since the imprisonment of Al Capone. Factor was supposed to have a claim on Humphreys' friendship by reason of his reported contribution of $50,000 towards Capone's defense fund when a kidnapping gang was believed to have marked Factor for ransom 18 months ago.
first car was Jake Factor's Duesenberg, presumably driven by his son, Jerry, or Jerome, and my dad, Charles. The second car was Jake the Barber and my step-granddad, Al Epstein. The third car was driven by an unknown chauffeur and had Jake's wife, Relicone Factor, and my grandmother, Mildred Epstein. Kidnappers Buck Henrinson, Eddie Schwabauer, Jimmy Tribble, and Charlie Icewagon Connors, all who worked for Roger Tuohy, surrounded Jake's car and took him in another waiting car and drove to Eddie Schwabauer's mother's house. Others in the party were released unharmed. This is the incident my dad told me about as a kid. When Schwabauer's mother saw the newspaper headlines in the morning, she told her son to get Jake out of her house. Schwabauer and Connors drove Jake Factor to a rented house in Bangs Lake, Illinois, where several of Tui's gang took turns keeping Jake company. When Jake got tired of talking with the gang, Henriksen hired comedy vaudeville entertainers Harry Gellis and Frankie Brown to entertain him. Jake spent the rest of his time playing cards and drinking. On July 12, 1933, Jake showed up in LaGrange, Illinois, and he flagged down a passing police car and told them, I'm Jake Factor, and I was kidnapped. The framing of Tui for the kidnapping began the next day on July 13th. The Cook County State's Attorney's Office Chief Investigator Daniel Tubbo Gilbert, who had a reputation for being corrupt, was already accusing the Tui gang for factors kidnapping with no evidence. Tui said that Gilbert hated him. Gilbert had known Roger Tui's brother Tommy when they were kids. They had some history. In 1923, Gilbert, then a beat cop, was shaking down bootleggers like Roger Tui. Tui refused to pay Gilbert's price for a barrel of beer. Gilbert wanted $5 a barrel and Tui offered $1.50 a barrel for protection. They argued about the protection price for six months. In 1933, Gilbert was under the influence of the outfit as well as being on the conspiracy to frame Roger Tui for Jake Factor's kidnapping. Still, in light of what was going on, the story of the kidnapping was beginning to unravel. Newspaper stories related the details of Jake Factor's financial schemes and people started to wonder if Factor had been kidnapped at all. Jake was working to get the public sympathetic to his side, as well as building a stronger case against Tui. Jake, using his contacts within the Tui gang, contacted a Tennessee moonshiner and mail thief, Isaac Costner, who was loosely associated with one of Tui's top guys, Basil Hugh Banghart. Jake told Costner he had himself kidnapped to avoid extradition back to England. Jake then offered Costner $25,000 to make the kidnapping look real. Jake wanted Banghart in on this scheme. Banghart was a professional car thief and also managed to escape from Atlanta Federal Prison more than one time. In 1933, Banghart escaped from Atlanta Federal Prison again, but this time went to Chicago and worked for Roger Tui as a gunslinger and a mail robber. In the summer of 1933, Factor, Costner, and Banghart met in the suburbs of Maywood, Illinois to talk about the plan. Banghart was suspicious of the scam. Factor was feeling the heat from the British government, which still wanted him extradited back to England. What Jake wanted Costner and Banghart to do was to call him with the FBI tapping the phone line and ask for an additional ransom of $25,000 cash payment. Banghart and Costner agreed. The next day, Costner called Factor's hotel suite while Tubbo Gilbert and FBI Special Agent Melvin Purvis listened in on the call. Costner was on the other end of the telephone line. 
he identified himself as one of the kidnappers. Costner was asking when the second half of the ransom would be paid. Jake told Costner he was having trouble raising the money and to call him back in a day or two. After that call ended, Jake, to the shock of law enforcement, called a press conference and announced the new demand for more ransom money. Gilbert and Purvis were listening on the line to that press conference. The newspapers ran the story and Jake Factor's story was again credible. When Costner and Banghart went to pick up the additional ransom, Chicago detectives set a trap with an army of 250 men, two airplanes, 62 police squad cars, and automatic weapons and bombs to get the kidnapper. Banghart got wise to the trap and made a run for it. He managed to get through roadblocks and after being fired at by police, hitting his car several times, but no bullets hit Banghart. He managed to escape this army of cops and get away by hitchhiking back to Chicago. When Banghart opened the ransom envelope that was supposed to hold the $25,000 in ransom money, he got a huge shock. There was only $500 and some cut up newspapers. Factor was now under the safety of Al Capone Chicago, but the highest powers in the empire demanded his arrest. Factor fought extradition all the way to the United States Supreme Court, but he had a weak case and deportation was inevitable. Just 24 hours before the court was to decide his fate, Factor had paid to have himself kidnapped and his case was postponed. U.S. laws require that a person who is not extradited within 60 days be released. Jake Factor managed to run out the clock and was not extradited to England. Now I could do an entire story on Roger Tui and several books have been written about him, but let's just say he was an Irish gangster in Chicago with a successful beer delivery franchise in rural Cook County that he bought from Johnny Torrio, Al Capone's old boss. It was manufactured in everything from massive distilleries to grimy bathtubs. It came into the brawling city by truck and motor car. On February 2nd, 1943, Jake Factor was convicted in federal court in Cedar Rapids, Iowa for mail fraud and sentenced to 10 years in prison and fined $10,000. Released from prison on February 9, 1949, Jake Factor was freed on parole after only serving six years of the 10-year sentence. And that was seven years after Jake and Rella were in Palm Springs in the family movies. Released from prison, Jake Factor took control of the Stardust Hotel Casino in Las Vegas in 1955, then the largest operation on the Vegas Strip. In the movie Casino, Robert De Niro stars as Sam Ace Rothstein, a Jewish-American top gambling handicapper who is called by the Italian mob to oversee the day-to-day -day operations at the fictional Tangiers Casino in Las Vegas. His character is based on Frank Rosenthal, who ran the Stardust, Fremont, and Hacienda Casinos in Las Vegas for the Chicago Outfit from the 1970s until the early 1980s. The casino's true owners, of course, were Chicago mob bosses Paul Rica, Tony Arcado, Murray Humphreys, and Sam Giancana. From 1955 to 1963, the length of Factor's tenure at the casino got the attention of the U.S. Justice Department that estimated the Chicago outfit skimmed between 48 to 200 million dollars from the Stardust alone. In 1956, while Factor and the outfit were growing rich off the Stardust, Roger Tui hired a quirky, high-strung, but highly effective lawyer named Robert B. Johnstone to take his case.
the same time, the McClellan Committee was looking into the ties between the Teamsters, Las Vegas, organized crime, and the raid at the mob conclave in New York State, which awakened the FBI and brought them into the fight. Two years after Toohey's murder in 1962, Attorney General Robert Kennedy ordered his Justice Department to look into the highly suspect dealings of the Stardust Casino. Factor was still the owner on record, but had sold his interest in the casino portions of the hotel for a mere $7 million. Then, in December of that year, the INS, working with the FBI on Bobby Kennedy's order, informed Jake Factor that he was to be deported from the United States before the end of the month. Factor would be returned to England, where he was still a wanted felon as a result of his 1928 stock scam. Just 48 hours before the deportation, Factor, John Kennedy's single largest personal political contributor, was granted a full and complete presidential pardon, which allowed him to stay in the United States. The story hints that Factor was more than probably an informant for the Internal Revenue Service. It also investigates the murky world of presidential pardons, the last imperial power of the executive branch. The mob wasn't finished with Factor. Right after his pardon, Factor was involved in a vague, questionable financial plot to try and bail Teamster boss Jimmy Hoffa out of his seemingly endless financial problems in Florida real estate. He was also involved in a questionable stock transaction with Murray Humphreys. Jake Factor spent the remaining 20 years of his life as a benefactor to California's black ghettos. He wanted to make amends for all of the suffering it caused in his life. He spent millions of dollars building churches, gyms, parks, low-cost housing in the poverty-stricken ghettos. When he died, three United States Senators, the Mayor of Los Angeles, Tom Bradley, and former Governor of California, Edmund Pat Brown, waited in the rain to pay their respects. In the 1936 films taken at my grandparents' residence in Palm Springs, I found who I think is Jake and Rella Factor, based on comparison of other photos. And of course, my dad never mentions Jake or Rella in his voiceover. He doesn't go into any details that might be a shady connection to the mob. I believe this is Rella Factor. You'll notice that Rella wasn't as camera shy as her husband Jake. The one question I ask in most chapters was, all these people were connected somehow and I couldn't figure out why they all came to Palm Springs at one time. Well, the common denominators that brought all these people together were, they all worked as performers or on the business side of the industry. Another was that most of the people in the film were Jewish. With Europe at war, the Jews in America were not going down without a fight. Meyer Lansky and Ben Bugsy Siegel were two Jewish gangsters who did their part against the Nazis in New York City in the mid-1930s. My dad says, we were a nice type group, implies to me, after reading several books on the subject, that they were part of the Kosher Nostra, the Jewish Mafia. Every family has a history. There might be old letters, photos, diaries, film footage buried in an attic with 
one or more members of your family. The lesson I learned was not to wait. Talk to older members of your families while they still have their memories. In my case, the discovery of those old 16 millimeter movies opened up a new chapter. Why did my parents never mention all these details? I'll never know. It was a nice tight group.